Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, this artist talk is um, a partnership between Green Hill and Greensboro Bound Literary Festival, which Steve Collier is going to talk about in a second. Um, I reached out to the folks at Greensboro Bound because I thought that this was a really great opportunity to talk about the intersection between making visual art and writing, um, because writing is a really important par part of so many visual artists' studio practice. Um, so what I hope for, for tonight is that you guys will all feel comfortable to ask questions and share your own experiences. Um, just go ahead and interject or raise your hand while we're talking. I hope that this will turn into a good discussion. Um, and I look forward to hearing all the perspectives that you guys bring to the table, whether you're coming from a place of writing or reading or making art. Um, I think it should be a good time. So let me bring Steve up here um, to talk about Greensboro Bound Festival for a little bit. Thanks yeah. so very much. I want to do three things real quickly. One is to thank Elizabeth and Katie both for this opportunity, because this is so cool, marrying reading and art and literary arts as a part of the whole. I'm one of 40 volunteers. Steve Mitchell is one of another of the 40 volunteers. And we're trying to put together a substantive major literary festival for Greensboro and Guilford County. We are putting that together. We are, my God, <laughs> yes. And really what we're doing is three things. The first is we've got year-long programming that culminates in three days in May, where we're looking to bring 60-plus authors to downtown Greensboro. And the reason we're doing that is because we think there's magic that occurs when you get readers and writers together. The second thing is we're making an explicit commitment to inclusivity, and we want to create a platform, a place for all of Guilford County's communities to tell their story. And third, we also want to get authors in front of kids, kids in front of authors, and books into the hands of kids. And at the end of the day, that's what Greensboro Bound Literary Festival is all about. One commercial. In the process of building this evening, Katie talked about some books that meant things to her, and those are over here um, for sale at the end of the evening. And the other thing is we have a little two-page brief on Greensboro Bound, and we also have some handy-dandy um, bookmarks to give you the, the website. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. So I would like to introduce Katie to all of you. Katie St. Clair is an artist based in Davidson, North Carolina, where she's an assistant professor of studio art at Davidson College. She teaches painting and drawing, basic and advanced. Mm -hmm. um, and she received her MFA from the University excuse me, of Michigan. Excuse me, the University yeah. of Michigan, magna cum laude. Oh, that was undergrad. Oh, that was undergrad? <laughs> yeah. That was undergrad? <laughs> well, after she... <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> after that, she received her MFA. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I thought... No, that was... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> she's very the smart. Art Academy of Cincinnati. She's very smart yeah. and well educated. She has exhibited her work internationally in Ireland and also here in the states in Ohio and Michigan. And she just moved to North Carolina about a year and a half ago. That's right. So Not she's too long. pretty new, and we're really happy to have her here. So Katie, why don't you start off our discussion by talking a little bit about the artworks that we've got in this exhibition at Green Hill right now? Sure. Wonderful. Well. 
first of all, thank you so much <laughs> and for having me. And thank you all for coming out tonight. It's lovely to have you here. Um, this work came from a really special place. Uh, I went to Ireland to teach painting and drawing uh, and to act as artist in residence in this landscape that was amazing. Um, it's a limestone landscape that's completely porous um, and almost desert-like. Like, it doesn't really have trees. It, it's not what you think of when you think of Ireland, like the green pastures, really. I mean, it's got these kind of rock mountains everywhere. And uh, the experience of being in that landscape utterly changed how I was thinking about working, which previously was much more realistically. I was um, really rendering a lot more and using a lot of collage material um, that I was taking. Um, but when I got to Ireland, I was looking for some new answers um, to some of the questions that I had. And I think that I found them by jumping rock walls, <laughs> uh, which is very um, responsible in Ireland, uh, as long as you put the rocks back if they fall over. Uh, so being from Cincinnati, Ohio, my dad has a farm in Kentucky. You don't jump walls in Kentucky. Like, if there's a fence, you stay on your side of the fence, you know? You don't want to get shot. <laughs> um, but in Ireland, the idea of boundaries was very different. And that really intrigued me. Like, you know, a farmer, you could just spend the night in a farmer's field. And they wouldn't come out and say, like, why are you on my property? I mean, that's, that's hard for me to believe. It's hard for me to sit here and say without, like, we have such tight boundaries. You imagine someone sleeping in your front yard and not being like, Someone, someone's got to <laughs> drag them away. Anyway, so I'm jumping rock walls, and I realized that I kept seeing these huge rocks called glacial erratics. And they were boulders from another environment that have been moved years and years, hundreds and hundreds of years ago by the glaciers, right? And so they're rocks from a different landscape. And they stick out like literally like a sore thumb, right? on the landscape. So I started realizing that I could follow those erratics. And instead of following the roads or paths, um, or even the goat paths, right? So all of a sudden, I was bisecting these mountainscapes and looking so closely um, once I got up to the glacial erratic at the lichen and the different things growing. And uh, I didn't go to Ireland thinking I was going to be painting rocks at all. In fact, when I got there, I didn't even know what I wanted to make. I, I was at this kind of transitional point where I wanted to make a new body of work. And so I started making a whole bunch of different bodies of work, right? And I was a little worried at first, and then I was like, oh, just stop, like, right? In the Irish mentality, just calm down. So I chilled out, and I just tried to make for a while without really having a, a firm direction which was wonderful because it opened up um, some space for me to play. And I think through that playing and the collections I was gathering, I found a huge amount of focus. Um, and uh, yeah, it ended up opening up how I was thinking. Uh, the, the, that was the biggest thing I took from it because when I was looking at these glacial erratics, I was thinking about their movement. I was thinking about how I was feeling in my body when I was finding them. I was thinking about how they were changing over time. For instance, when it rains, uh, and it rains in Ireland a lot, uh, the water actually has eroded the ground around these glacial erratics. So now they sit on pedestals, like because the ground has been eroded. So it makes you start to think about how long they've been there and how short of a life we actually live in comparison. Um, and then, I don't know, I, I was really humanizing these rocks, right? I was like, we're visitors, we understand each other. Like, <laughs> um, and I think in that process, I started to um, think about all the things that you could include in a visual piece of work that isn't just representation. Anyway. Um, so, so that's it. That's, that's great. So can you talk a little bit about um, 
writing, how writing is involved in your work. Um, is it a natural part of your studio process, or is it something that you've learned to come to through school? Um, where does it fit in? Oh, that's, that's hard. So school, um, I was homeschooled. So I had a studio practice from about age 13 on, uh, and it was self-directed. Uh, so I didn't really have an art teacher. I had one that I started going to for a while in my homeschooling network, and she eventually said, Katie, just make your own work. Like, <laughs> and so she actually put me in charge of teaching other students. Uh, so right off the bat, I didn't come to my art education in a formal sense. Um, I was also did not have someone who was telling me what to read, right? I was able to read whatever I wanted to read. And so I took full advantage of that, and I read all the time. I, mean, I loved reading. Uh, but one of my favorite things to do actually was listen to books on tape while I was working. So I would be in my studio, and I would just work for eight hours until the book was over. Like, I, I wouldn't want to stop because I would, I would be understanding the writing of the book, the storyline, the structure of the characters through how I was painting. And to this day, if I look back at those paintings, I remember the books I was reading. What sort of books were you reading? Was it fiction or about art? Mm -hmm. They were all different kinds of books. I loved, uh, I loved histories about, anything about the natural environment was, was right up my alley. But mm -hmm. histories, I remember some fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, I remember uh, reading Women Who Run With the Wolves <laughs> while I was doing one piece in particular and being like awestruck. By, there's um, one story about uh, these bones being dragged on shore and kind of having to be, she has to, this character rebuilds this bone structure. Mm -hmm. And it's this wonderful, like really scary, but it turns out to be this gorgeous story. And I remember the moment of like, working this painting and being like, what if I added like bones to the structure? It's like, what would that do to this, this painting that at the time was all of these beautiful colors and it was mainly a landscape and flowers. And I started thinking about Dutch still life paintings and it just really opened up the way I was thinking about working. Oh, you're able to make connections across disciplines, which is pretty cool. So, um, Take us to your studio when you're making an artwork. Um, so you make the artwork first, and then you have to think about it, or, like in writing. How, how, I mean, obviously with the so glacial same. erratics, mm -hmm. um, you, you kind of learned what the paintings were about as you were making them. But do you ever paint without knowing what it's about? <laughs> yeah, I think that's how the erratics started, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, they started much more fluidly mm -hmm. than with a concrete idea. Uh, and I think that was what was so exciting, uh, like breath of fresh air about the body of work, was that normally I started with a very crisp idea um, of what I was going to do and the things that I wanted to say. Mm. Um, I think through writing, I was able to start bringing my ideas of uh, tactile qualities into the work and give that that sen those sensations a place to live without having to be overly literal in the paintings, right? So in that way, you can talk about rocks moving over space in, a, in an artist statement. I don't have to sit there and illustrate for you where the rocks came from and where they moved to, to illustrate that. Um, and so I think in that way, the power of words actually to like reframe work. Like what a, what a wonderfully brilliant, open way to think about art making. Like you could reframe these as abstractions. You could reframe them as, as rocks. You could reframe them as butterfly wings or flowers, um, something ephemeral that changes constantly, or something very inert that's unchanging. Um, so I think in that way, you could bring in potentially all different kinds of content um, while being more fluid about how you're willing to look at the marks you're making. 
Mm. While still being specific, of course, mm -hmm. because they're definitely studied. So, do when when you write about your work, when you wrote your um, artist statement for glacial erratics, do you write that for yourself, or are you writing that for other people to read? It's hard. So, um, for a while, I was taking notes to myself, uh, and they normally got scratched down on my hand while I was walking. I'd have a pen with me because I'd inevitably forget my sketchbook. <laughs> And the pockets on this I know. <laughs> like I had to get a really tiny sketchbook, and then I would always leave it because it was so tiny. But it was it fit in my pocket, and then I wouldn't want to sit on it, so I'd pull it out. So I would normally write notes on my wrist, actually. Um, and when I'd be walking, if I found something really compelling, I would write it down. Um, for a while, I was actually taking photographs of my my wrist <laughs> to document, right? Like, <laughs> it made sense to me instead of rewriting. Um, but there's, there's a moment where that part of the practice was observational. And I think reflective later as thinking about how that has, how the environment has affected me. But mainly the writing is to give an audience a glimpse into what the experience was, to the small moments and things we don't normally look at. And hopefully in those moments, you can start to engage your own environment in a new way and spend more time looking or maybe being present or still and seeing things you maybe would look past. That's really interesting. Steve, you've got a question. The choice of colors between this one on the right and the other three is, is substantive. So what was, what is the difference from where you were coming from between this one and the other three? So something wonderful happened in between uh, this painting in particular and these paintings. And that was that I went with, um, <laughs> I got to take a group of students um, along with, I got to um, go along with an old advisor of mine um, down into the caves of Ireland. So we went with these students with headlamps um, and some guides into these amazing caving systems underground. And I had been in caves before, uh, art-related trips. But being in this cave, it was called Gollum, too. Talk about a literary uh, <laughs> connection. Uh, and named after, like, the character Gollum was named after this cave, in fact. So um, yeah, it, there was just something brilliant about going, we had to spelunk down, or, and there was actually a crevice in the ground that you had to like, you kind of, it was like the earth opened up. There wasn't a cave entrance. There was a slit under a rock that we kind of wedged ourselves into. And there was this feeling that rock is so much more pervasive than we think. And what happens when we're inside the stone that I'd been researching, right? I'd been walking around finding. So when that happened, of course, I think it changed how I was seeing color. And um, after that, the piece on the end uh, came into being shortly after that. And that feeling of kind of glowing rocks, because when, you're, when the light from your headlamp hits the rock, it, it turns it into kind of this, these glowing sculptural forms, because the water has run around them one way or the next. So, that's such a beautiful image. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty weird. You've got to go. Geographically, what, what part of Ireland is north and east west? It's on the west coast. West the coast. burn is west coast. It's about an hour below Galway and maybe 20 minutes above the Cliffs of Moher. Oh, okay. Yeah, so right on the coastline. Okay, so look it up now. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a beautiful place to visit. And uh, there's a national park with no signs. Mm -hmm. So you just have to drive around and stop and ask someone, and then they'll give you really convoluted directions, which are great. It's like the directions. I love this. Uh, drive down the road. You'll see a cemetery on the left. Keep driving. And then you'll see a couple of cow pastures and keep driving. <laughs> and then you'll see a few more roads ahead of you. Just keep on driving. <laughs> so it was, it was always quite a story to get to your um, your destination. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to pivot this conversation a little bit. When we've talked in the past, you have told me a little bit 
about your unique relationship between collage, writing, and dyslexia. Can you tell me a little bit more about that experience? Yeah, so um, I'm dyslexic. And one of the things with dyslexia uh, that comes is a kind of different way of thinking, right? You're seeing things and things are shifting around. You're thinking differently than uh, maybe that. If you've noticed, I talk in circles sometimes, <laughs> right? I'll swing around and I normally come to a point eventually. And I think that is part of my thinking process. And one that is hard for a lot of people to embrace, right? Because we come from a very linear, linear system that wants us to understand our ideas and then produce something that shows our ideas. And that's, that's a great and very easily calculable system. But it's not one that I think that I've ever been able to use with much success, unfortunately. So instead, I've allowed myself to run in circles. And I think in that way, with dyslexia, I also see things as very fractured. Uh, my writing has always been very fractured, to the point where, uh, for so many years, people were saying, outlines, outlines, outlines. And I could not, for the life of me, make an outline that made <laughs> any sense. It really kind of upset me. So what I started doing instead is I'd start doing free writes. And, um, and I still do this to this day. So I will free write and I will color code everything that I've written afterwards. So if ideas have to do with the natural world or um, my senses, they'll get color coded in different piles. And I will do this with pages and pages of writing. And then I will spread all of the colors out on the floor, along with my collage material, because it's normally in my studio. And I start fragmenting the word, or I start putting the words back together, the word fragments. Um, and in that way, I can kind of see what I'm really interested in. If I'm writing about something over and over and over, and it keeps coming up, it's going to get a big pile of color. Um, in the same way that one of these paintings, like the pink painting, has a mass majority of light pink in it. Um, and then it has flashes of brown and blue that come in, that kind of turn that pink on. In the same way, writing, for me, does the same thing, right? So I see this pile of, of gorgeous green, um, different shades, because you've got to kind of subdivide, right? And uh, then all of a sudden, I would know what I need to focus writing on. And I'd start picking the fragments back out. And the ones that stuck out to me, I would continue writing. So I would bring the writing back in. And in that way, I could structure um, really complex ideas, but I was able to find focus for myself. Uh, and then I could literally move them around. Um, I can't do that on a computer. I don't, it just stops for me for some reason. Yeah. But through paper and color, I could figure it out. So I think there is fracture in my work because of that. Uh, I think there's fracture in my writing because of that. And I think there's fracture in how I speak. And I hope in some way that that different way of thinking working can inspire others who don't, who don't think in traditional ways to um, embrace their different way of learning and figure out how to make that work for them. Um, because I think our world is ever changing. Our academic environment is changing and needs to change. Uh, so it can hold more people and different ways of thinking. Um, anyway, that's great. Before we move on, does anyone have any questions yet? OK. Well, the next thing that I think could be interesting to talk about, and I'd really love to hear from you guys what you think. Um, so. In my mind, there's this continuum of opinions about art and writing and what each one has to do with the other. On one end of the spectrum, there may be people who think that a writing is a distraction and that we should just be looking at pure image. Um, and then all the way on the other side, you might have someone who thinks that there, one can't exist without the other. You need to write about your work to understand it. And um, when you're coming into a gallery, you expect to have an, a curator statement, um, wall labels in every work, and it's a way to help communicate. Um, maybe can you kick us off about your opinions on the place of 
writing in a gallery. And then I would really like to hear from you guys at any point, just chime in. Yeah. Well, I think that for every artist, it's different yeah. what they want, mm -hmm. right? How much uh, they want to give the viewer. I think having enough access for people to be able to connect to the work is important. Mm -hmm. Some people don't want to look at a statement before they come into a gallery, and you should be able to do that and still get something, I believe, from the work. Um, I, I think as well that if, whenever you read something, your ideas have shifted to a certain focus. And that is a skill as an artist you could really use to benefit the work, right? Because you could get your viewers uh, thinking in a certain way before they start looking. Um, my favorite is actually going to experience the work and then going back to read the statement and then doing another run around the gallery. Because a lot of times I will start, I saw some hands back there. <laughs> yeah. um, I will start to see things the second time around with the artist's um, words, but I also see things that they weren't talking about the first time because I have my own experiences that I'm able to actually bring onto the work. So I would highly recommend giving that a try at some point if you haven't, um, but I would love to hear from you all what you, what you think the place of um, how writing fits into a gallery. If you all have any thoughts on that. I know one thing Steve and I were talking about a little bit earlier is, and you touched on it just a couple minutes ago, is sometimes that little piece of artist writing can give you an insight into the process. So when you're looking at a finished work of art, it can often be misleading in the way that you think that it was perfectly formed in the artist's mind and it happened in some magical mm -hmm. act. But when I read a text um, from you or from any other artist, it makes me think about the journey that art, that artist took to get to the finished product. So it's kind of like a little bit of excavation to me when I'm reading an artist statement. You see the work yeah. that, it, that, that happens. And the stuff that could be hidden. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 something that you wouldn't even notice. <laughs> You've got a question. Are these your comments that are with the paintings here? Are these that, that's, are a, that's a little excerpt from Katie's artist statement. OK. Mm -hmm. Did I mean, you get a chance to read it? I did not. No, <laughs> I was just noticing that was considerably longer than the other. I just wondered, if, could you comment on this painting a little bit? The, the, that's a lot longer than the other. Oh, could I comment on what Either made the this writing? Or the, 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 the writing is a little bit of your um, <laughs> erratic statement, <laughs> so, <laughs> which which you just talked about. Yeah, yeah. So the erratic statement. I actually don't even know what that excerpt says <laughs> oh, okay. at the moment. Um, to be completely honest, it's from my artist statement, and my artist statement is broken down. First, it has two voices which is kind of interesting in writing, that we can use different voices. My authentic voice is, is the one that's just explaining what I'm feeling and seeing and touching and, oh, how excited I am. But then, of course, I start with a much more kind of professional academic voice that starts by saying, explaining what I'm doing um, in a pretty clear sense, more or less, my experiences and what got me there. And so there's a space where I go into journal entry almost experiential writing and um, that's that's and then I come back from it so maybe keep that in mind I don't know if you're um, an artist or you're trying to play with those ideas I think that's a way for me to be very authentic while still um, fitting into some of the constructs I had another question, sorry. sure uh, when you describe your way of thinking mm -hmm. um, how do you say look at that painting and know inside that it's finished, that this is finished. You know, it's funny. This painting in particular got finished very fast. Um, it, it really, I was walking around on the cars one of the last days I was in Ireland, and I just, everything was really bright that day. Um, the light was bouncing off the rock. And I think I was just so overjoyed with the experience and so sad at the same time to be leaving. Um, and there was a point where I just, I needed to make one more painting. 
Like I just couldn't not. And I went back to the studio and I bought a gallon of gesso and I stretched like then and there. I was like, they were like, what are you doing? And I was like, no, no, I've got to, I've got to do this. And I was going to be leaving I mean, it was right at the end. Um, and I didn't have time to uh, become, I don't know, I had to get done. I didn't have a choice. So there's this wonderful time pressure thing that happens sometimes. And I tell my students to set their timers occasionally. We'll say, OK, guys, 20 minutes, this painting's got to be done. Like, and there's a point where they get really excited. Some of them hate it. Some of them love it and thrive from that kind of energy. Uh, because they know after 20 minutes, they can sit down. They can look at it. They don't have to paint for the rest of class if they don't want to. They could actually just write about what they did but that they needed to put that exerted energy in. So I think because that came from that time and process, there's a simplicity to it, but there's also a complexity for me within kind of explaining what that experience was. Because my time in Ireland was pretty simple. I mean, I ate and I worked. <laughs> and I walked around <laughs> and I looked at rocks. And <laughs> it, was, it was beautifully, still. So, and I think that's as much energy that's in this painting. I think there's a stillness about it. And I think that's what I need to capture. What advice do you have for artists who are trying to write about their work? Be authentic and try to be as honest as possible about what you're actually thinking about. And if it sounds ridiculous and not up to snuff, try to be more specific. <laughs> a lot of times uh, in artist statements that I've seen, people make pretty big generalizations. Uh, my work is about everything. Isn't all of our work about everything, right? Like, um, you know, I think that if you can be specific about what your everything is, and how that fits into context um, with ideas that come, come up, um, maybe in your studies or what, whatever inspires your work, that specificity will take you much further than those generalizations. And I think they'll, it'll lend access to your audience, right? Um, you want to be able to stay open with ideas, I believe. Um, because I think you want as many people to be able to get into the work as possible. But staying open and being nonspecific are two very different things. Um, so I think in writing, the more open you can stay while being hyper-specific. And one, so I, we were lucky enough to spend time together there, uh -huh. which was wonderful. But one of the things I remember when you were showing me sketches sometimes, we would come back and, and compare sketches. And I, I find that I do this a lot. And I, I think you, some of the work you showed me would, would emphasize this, but I, I don't know if you would agree that I find that a lot of times sketches and writing happen together, that these are not processes that necessarily happen in one space at one time and then one space at another time, that you can be speaking both visual and audible language kind of together. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you still find that um, when you record memory or record experience. Definitely do. I mean, if, if you have your, your sketchbook and you're, you're thinking about things and you're drawing things, it makes really a lot of sense that they're one and the same. Uh, I use writing actually as checklists too in my, like I will do sketches of a painting before it's done. And I will actually go back through and I'll write myself notes on what I'm liking in the, the space or what's working, what's not working, what could be shifted. And so I normally have these progressive uh, sketches of paintings um, and what I was thinking about while I was making them, which is really nice to have that embedded in the process. Um, so yeah. So there's literal words hidden in these somewhere? No, in the tiny sketch. <laughs> in the sketch. OK, I see. In sketch. The yeah, so I would actually sketch one of these in process I see. before it was finished to I figure see. out where I should go next. I see. And then it would be like notes to self, right? Oh. Like, but with the sketch. <laughs> That's neat. You've got a question? Yeah, could you talk a bit about your um, process in terms of yeah, materials and, and color? 
Um, I use a lot of different materials, mixed media, um, from across the board. And that's very general, right? That's the general statement. Um, that said, there's, I'm using natural pigments, um, dry dyes, as well as um, like loose pigments that I can throw and then move. I'm using a lot of wet media. Uh, so I use fluid acrylics on a very technical level. Uh, Golden makes gorgeous very, very saturated, pigmented acrylics um, that work almost more like ink than they do uh, like acrylic. And I've, I've enjoyed those. So you can see this area is, is the acrylic. Um, and then some of these are the pigments that are coming in that have been tossed. I've been um, dyeing rice paper. So days my studio will be hung with all different shades of drying rice paper. Uh, so that is incorporated. I take my own photographs to use as collage material. So you'll see snippets of different photos. These are leaves um, and watery sticks, it looks like. Um, and then there's also the texture comes from gesso, actually, uh, that gets laid down throughout the process. So a lot of that texture is coming from, from drying gesso. Um, and I think that's more or less happening in all of them. Um, there's, there are other things that I'm using too. Powdered graphite comes in sometimes. Uh, aerosol, uh, spray paint. Um, ink definitely um, shows up quite a lot too. Uh, but yeah, it, gets, it changes. And then I'll, I'll get on a new tangent and then I'll be off to using some kind of new material, but some sticks. And is it, in, is it informed by where you are? Are you capturing, are you using color from your surroundings? Oh, yeah. The colors are actually, the craziest part is people think I'm exaggerating. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the amazing thing, so the karst, because it's kind of a white gray, changes with the light. So when the sun sets or rises in Ireland, the mountains become pink, mm -hmm. and they become purple, mm -hmm. and they become blue. Uh, and they look like a painting. Uh, so it, the craziest thing is I would literally go out and I would try, and I'm, um, I made handmade wallpaper for years in New York uh, where I had to match color to the tea. Like we didn't have the thing, you know, when you go to buy paint at a store and they mix it up off of a swatch. They just gave us a recipe card that never matched. And then we have, we'd have to hand mix it. So I can mix color to a tea. And I would literally do that in the colors. No one would believe me. They were like, you're exaggerating. <laughs> like, and it's, it was, it's from the mountains um, or from the lichen, right? So there's lichen I was pulling from. There were mushrooms. There were reflections off of the water. Um, the seaweed was the most green, green. I mean, it was fluorescent almost. Um, and once you start pulling from those different places, of course, they didn't necessarily line up to where I'm putting them in place, but they're very much um, observed. Can you talk a little bit more about, you, you talked about listening to audiobooks when you were a teenager mm -hmm. and the beginnings of your artistic mind were developing. Can you talk a little bit about how books serve you now that you're an art professor and you're teaching students and what are you trying to learn? Do you read for fun in addition to reading for art? What's your relationship like with books now? In the summer, I read for fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, during, during the semester, I read for the students and for the work. Um, but I've had to separate it. And there's actually a month that takes place when school ends before summer actually begins, when I'm kind of decompressing, <laughs> uh, where it's really hard for me to read anything. And then all of a sudden, I'll get this pang. It's like really deep-seated. Like, what happened to my books? <laughs> and then I will start reading again. And normally, I, I get into moments where I just, that's when I get really excited, excited about reading again. But I find that during the school year, I get, especially with having dyslexia, right, a bit bombarded with um, <laughs> emails and a bunch of different writing and reading uh, that ends up slowing my own um, just enjoyment of reading down a bit. So can you talk about a few books that have been especially 
productive in your studio practice? Some books that have been influential in the way that you're thinking about what you're making? Absolutely. Yeah, so there's actually my probably five top books sitting over on that table. Um, one is uh, Margaret Livingston, and she actually, the um, photo with the Mona Lisa on it, she studies how, um, how we see color and perceive color. Uh, and so it's really interesting. Like she talks about being able to, um, that we perceive value before we perceive saturation, right? So that means if we put this, this painting in black and white, you would see that black and white structure before you would notice the yellow or the green, right? Which means, as an artist, you have full potential opportunity for putting colors where they don't belong, right? If someone's going to instantly see the value and see the color later, you have that moment where you can play. And people will still see, if you're trying to represent a face, right, that people will still see it for what it is. Um, also, dif different illusions. Um, color is all about its context, right? So different colors can look completely different depending on what they're surrounded by. So she goes into that and a bit of color theory and different things. Um, art, is, art as Experience is a wonderful book um, that I go back to pretty consistently about being immersed in the process and experience of making. Um, I've got Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Uh, which it's such a sweet story, but it's really about looking. It's about being in the moment and being very observant in that moment. And I think it's, it's a really well-written um, experience of that. I've got uh, Diane Ackerman's, um, um, <laughs> uh, I just forgot it in the moment. Natural history of the senses. <laughs> Thank you, Natural History of the Senses, um, which is, one of my top favorites, even though I forgot it in the moment. <laughs> um, it is all about the five senses and how they're working, how we're perceiving smell, um, and how that shows up um, in our lives uh, through all different kinds of modes. So it goes through all five senses. Um, and I, I just, there's a lot of really amazing books out there. But when you're, when you're picking books and you're really trying to focus a practice, it's great to uh, draw from things that, that get you a bit closer to how you're thinking about your process. And I think all those books definitely um, got me closer to making this body of work for sure. And also, I love bringing them in for the students because they get a lot from um, some of the different books. So it's great. That's good advice. We've got 15 more minutes left of this discussion. So I'd like to open it up to you guys um, with any final questions for Katie um, or comments about your own experience as a writer. Maybe you're coming to this discussion without an artistic background, but as a background as a writer. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about some of this. So I'm a writer. The, the ecrastic idea of bringing some writers in to look at art and try to write in response and back and forth. I'm curious what your experience has been with that. I, I, I got lucky with one um, yeah. that, that hit a journal and all that, which was very interesting. But even more gratifying is when an artist writes to you and says, yeah, you know, for me it was a Lakota, you know, when I was at this age, for you it was this other guy, but. Yeah. Uh, I actually got to work with a poet um, on this body of work, which was fantastic. She came to my studio and we sat and talked about the practice and process. She had been to Ireland um, and had some pretty ex exciting experiences while she was there. And she actually wrote a whole series of, of poems off of um, my making experience. Being in the studio, thinking about Ireland, her experience in Ireland, and nothing was explained. It was, I mean, a lot of it was, it was like, um, in a weird way, I became her muse at that moment. And she, in turn, in this beautiful way with her writing coming back to me, helped me see the landscape in a completely different way. Because it was through her filter, not mine. And it gave me this great sense of distance from this thing that was so close to me. 
Uh, and it was an amazing experience. I, if you haven't tried it and you're a writer or, or an or a artist, it's really um, amazing process. Um, so. so we need to connect some writers with some artists tonight to make something like yeah. that happen. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. I'm very curious to know what you're working on now that you're back in North Carolina and in Davidson. Absolutely. So I, I've been going back and forth about some different ideas. I was thinking to myself I would do some far aiming project where I'd put myself into a new environment. And then I was like, no. I want to work off of what's here. Like, I want to invest in here. So I started taking walks this past summer especially, and uh, I got very interested in mycology. So I have been collecting mushrooms uh, and studying their forms and colors, uh, which has been really brilliant. Um, also, the, the color of the soil really interests me. Unfortunately, the bedrock uh, is very far beneath us in North Carolina because the glaciers never made it down this far. So um, they're under feet and feet and feet of soil. Uh, but I found all of these other things have been coming up as, as inspiration. Um, so I've been working on some paintings that are starting to come into focus now. But, um, and I've been doing writing with it, but if I was to tell you right now exactly what they were about in full specificity, I, I don't think I could, I think I would be partially lying <laughs> because I, I don't, I've got a very clear sense actually now after a few days, the past few days I've been in my studio, almost the whole day, which has been great, but it's coming together. So I'm hopefully. Sure you've been influenced by the other artists there, like Herb Jackson and Russell Warren. Or, or is there a, I mean, I know it's a pretty tight community, so. Uh. It is. I didn't, I met Herb when I came down uh, for the first time about midway through my first year at Davidson. So I've only known him for probably nine, nine months. Um, and he's a wonderful, uh, um, a wonderful man and an amazing artist. And I really, I remember the first time I saw his work. There's some similarities, uh, funny enough, with color. <laughs> Yeah. No, completely. And I remember seeing his work and thinking, yeah, I belong here. <laughs> like, this, these are my people. <laughs> like, in a really wonderful way. Um, if you haven't gotten a chance to see, look up Herb Jackson's paintings, they're, they're quite beautiful. Um, uh, yeah, and the, the other professors who work at Davidson have been, and they're my comrades in arms, right? Uh, and so they're, it's really exciting to be able to share my practice with them, uh, especially in such an amazing environment. He just had a show in Raleigh where everything was dark and the paintings were only, the only things that were lit, and that's kind of reminded me of okay. when you talk about seeing the light on the, yeah. the paintings, how they glow. Yeah. We've had a, a few studio visits, um, it was a few months ago, I think, and I got to go and see a studio, which was wonderful. It was really beautiful. Did you have a question? Um, how does like dyslexia um, affect your painting? Oh, it affects it in big ways. I don't think I would be a painter without dyslexia. I I think that I needed a place when I was in school where I could show how I was thinking. Um, and I don't think that the tests allowed me to do that. I couldn't shine. Um, and when I paint, I get really big. I like shine. I'm already tall, and I get even bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that I don't know if I would have made it through school if I didn't have something that made me feel really big, because it was really hard. Um, so I think dyslexia, in a weird way, is why I'm here. It's kind of backwards, right? Just like dyslexia, <laughs> dyslexia is a little backwards. Um, but dyslexia teaches you to work really hard for what you want, as long as you have something you're passionate about, right? That's, that's why you read. I couldn't read until I was uh, in fourth or fifth grade, right, at all. Um, and that was very tricky because everyone else could. 
Um, so because I could paint, though, everyone would tell me things to paint or draw. So they'd be like, oh, could you draw blah, 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 blah? So I would draw people stuff and like give it to them and make friends that way. <laughs> um, so I learned strategies, which dyslexia teaches kids, right? It teaches you strategies of how to survive in a system that's not quite yours. And, um, and then because you can survive, all of a sudden when you get out into the world, if you have a passion, there's no boundaries because you know how to survive anything, right? If you can make it through school, so. Yeah. Have you ever used uh, like written word in collaboration with your paintings? And like, um, I don't know, some people like use, like write things in their lines and their mm -hmm. like contours and their um, shapes. I wonder, since you have that interconnectivity between the yeah. two, do you ever? I have never brought words into my paintings because words and I have had such a kind of a, <laughs> a tricky relationship, right? But the funniest thing is last uh, year I was asked to do a, um, a group project with the students at Davidson and they wanted me <laughs> to be Bob Ross. Uh, so, <laughs> so I played Bob Ross and we did um, we did paintings where I needed a structure for them to work with. And since everyone at Davidson, so, well, not everyone, but a lot of people at Davidson are very comfortable with words. So I figured those would be good building blocks to work with. So we used stencils of different letters. And all the students used those shapes and forms to build up paintings. Um, and so it was a really fun process and project. But some of the students chose to write and incorporate that language in. Others chose to use it as structure. And so it was a very fun project and I would highly recommend it if you're interested in morphing those two together. It's There's great. a question back yeah. there. Back in the back. Yeah. Um, uh, we, uh, I was just looking at the size of your paintings and how you said you, know, you got very big when you painted and I wonder if you ever do anything small. <laughs> I do, actually um, I didn't for a long time because I love, I love the stretch. Right, like if you're I'm six foot two, right? I've got a big stretch and I can, I can kind of dance across the canvas. But I realized when I work small, it's a very different way of holding space. Um, so you use different joints, right? When you're painting big, you not only use your wrist and your elbow and your shoulder, but you use your whole body. You've got all of those different joints engaged. Where when you're working very small, to keep the same amount of uh, fluidity and gesture and energy, you have to be a lot more willing to do things fast. And like, um, you learn to kind of move your body in a different way. And so I actually will protect my paper so I can be a little more expressive. Mm -hmm. So I'll tape off areas of my paper and I will actually then let myself um, kind of go. But those become, a lot of times inspiration for bigger pieces, but another size, right? You can't always make big paintings. Yeah. So you gotta be able to keep working. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Is the yellow in here representational or is it emotional? Uh, the yellow, that's actually the same color as the lichen wow. in Ireland and there's no I, it is that yellow, if not more yellow. Like the paint doesn't do it just, justice. Um, so, no, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a thing to behold. It really is. Anyone else before we wrap up? Well, I think we'll close there. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. And before you go, I want to remind you guys to come back to Green Hill um, at the beginning of December. Winter Show is going to be opening December 3rd and it'll run through January 13th. And if you want a sneak peek of Winter Show, you can get advanced tickets for our event cho First Choice, which is on November 29th. Um, and you can purchase tickets for that on our website. It's going to be really exciting. Big party. Um, <laughs> and also, um, remember to keep tabs on the Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. Steve, when is the Literary Festival going to happen? May 18th, 19th, 20th of 2018, although we are doing things all year long in preparation for it. Absolutely. 
Well, thank you guys again, and um, we'll stick around a little bit for um, some minutes um, afterwards. If you want to come up and meet Katie or talk with um, Steve or anyone, feel free. Thanks for coming. Thank you all.